Let's pray. Uh, Father, thank you uh, for gathering us together tonight. And Holy Spirit, I pray that you would indwell us and teach us and open our ears and our hearts, Lord. And uh, Father, we would see that um, we have such an amazing King in Jesus. And Lord, that he lived his life as a man and showed humanity and specifically us as Christ believers, how to live and how to fight the good fight of faith. So, Lord, as we go into your word tonight, press into us, through us, and out of us, Lord, all that you have so that we can change this world and reach the lost. And I ask this humbly in Jesus' name and all at the table said, amen, amen. amen. So last week we started chapter four and we're looking at the temptation of Christ and uh, Last week I talked about there was three areas that Satan attacks Jesus in, and we looked at the first area, which was an appeal to the lust of the flesh. Tonight we're going to look at the second and third temptations that Satan brings against Jesus, or brings to Jesus, and, uh, and we're going to see how those temptations and those things that Jesus this was confronted with they're very much the same things that we're confronted with all the time in our lives so let's start with the second temptation an appeal to the pride of life if you'd open up your bibles or your tablets whatever you have to matthew chapter 4 verse 5 is where we're going to start I'm reading out of the esv tonight it says then the devil took him to the holy city and set him on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him if you are the son of god throw yourself down for it is written, he will command his angels, and on their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against a stone. And Jesus said to him, again it is written, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. So now if you remember, Jesus has been out in the wilderness for 40 days, and he's been fasting, and during that time, Satan is there, and again, we don't see in Scripture what Satan was doing, but he is around. And we saw last week that after 40 days, Jesus is hungry, and the first thing that Satan does is he plays on, on Jesus' flesh, the lust of the flesh, in wanting to uh, have food and to take away the hunger pains. And so Jesus responds to him. Through Scripture, now we see that Jesus is going to go from the wilderness to the holy city. And this is done in a matter of seconds. Jesus is in the wilderness, now he's in the holy city. Listen, this is just an example of how quickly Jesus responds to us. Jesus can be anywhere at any time, right, at any moment that we need him. He's there for us. And so Satan takes him to the holy city, and it says that he set him on the pinnacle of the temple. Now, the pinnacle of the temple was about 200 feet above the Kidron Valley. It was very visible. It was the, the, the pinnacle was the very top, the very tip of the temple. And he takes Jesus to the top of this pinnacle, and he says to him that if you are the Son of God, so again, Satan brings the question. Last week he said, if you're the Son of God, turn these stones into bread. Now he says, if you're the Son of God, throw yourself down. So Satan tempts Jesus to force God into a supernatural incident now. Here we see that Satan appears, uh, appeals to the pride of life. If you think about it, this would have been a very spectacular intervention by God's part if Jesus had leapt off the building, put himself down off of the building, and these angels would have came out of nowhere and caught him up and brought him safely to the ground. And here, Satan really plays on the thing that I believe is within every man and every woman. And what it is is to have God's approval and to have that approval demonstrated for all to see. There's something in us that wants to be noticed. And especially when it comes to God. We want people to notice God's favor. 
or what God has given us or, or the abilities that God has gifted us with. And so this leap from that height, right, and to have the promised angelic protection would have been an incredible event, an event that had been witnessed by thousands that would have been in the city. They would have seen it. If they would, if they'd have looked up, they looked to the temple. The temple was a reminder that God was with them. And so as a Jew, you would constantly be looking at this temple. You would look at the pinnacle that is stretching to the sky and reminding you of God's presence in the city and in your life. And so to have looked up and seen Jesus and Satan and to see them on this pinnacle and then Jesus to leap off of the pinnacle and have angels come and swoop them up would have been incredible. It would have been the talk of the city. Here's the thing. Jesus isn't into, the, isn't into the spectacular, man. He's not. In fact, Jesus had already experienced the spectacular when the Holy Spirit came and rested on him after he was baptized. So here, the devil's suggestion to Jesus to leap is an artificial crisis that Satan is bringing to Jesus. And he's doing this in the sense to say, do this to prove this, Jesus. And it wasn't an act of Jesus being obedient in service, but rather it would have been an act of Jesus trying to demonstrate that God was with him. Church, here's what I want you to understand tonight. Is that God will rescue us. He will rescue us. We don't need to create a crisis in order for God to come in and rescue us. And we have to be careful to not create a crisis that forces God to have to come and rescue us. And I'm going to talk a little bit about that towards the end of our message. Now, Satan says something very interesting here. He says, it is written. Here's what you need to understand, is that the devil can use this phrase also. Right? We can trust that the devil had memorized Scripture. He knew the Bible himself. And he is an expert at quoting it. But here's the key. Satan will quote it out of its context for one purpose, to confuse and defeat those who he tempts. Now, as I stated last week, Satan is going to quote out of Psalm 91, which is traditionally the beginning of that psalm, is traditionally seen in Jewish thought as a prayer against demonic activity. And he specifically quotes from Psalm 91, 11 and 12. And he takes it out of contents. In other words, what he tells Jesus is, go ahead. If you do this, the Bible promises angels will rescue you. And it will be, this, it'll be a spectacular self-promotion. But again, Satan takes it out of context. I like what Spurgeon said about this. He says, Satan borrowed our Lord's weapon and said, It is written, but he did not use the sword lawfully. It was not in the nature of the false fiend to quote correctly. He left out the necessary words in all thy ways. Thus he made the promise say what in truth it was never suggested. Psalm 91 says in all thy ways, right? So if we're, if we're walking in the ways of God, in all his ways, then we can expect angelic intervention on our behalf. But Satan leaves out that small tidbit and misquotes scripture. So if we look closely, this quote of Scripture was wrongly applied for two reasons. Number one, it did not encourage. And secondly, it did not teach. But rather, he said it to be deceptive. Satan is always going to try to deceive us. He's going to always try to bring deception in. He is the master illusionist church. And so, listen, the bottom line is that we have to be careful when others are quoting Scripture to us. I tell you guys all the time, check out what I say. Don't take it for granted. You need to be sure 
that what I'm saying or anybody else is saying, that it's in the correct context. Right? So here's the thing. Jesus understood from his knowledge of the whole counsel of God that Satan was twisting this passage from Psalm 91. Jesus knew it. Jesus knew how to rightly divide the word of truth. 2 Timothy 2.15 tells us that we need to rightly divide the word of truth. But sadly, many are willing to believe anyone who quotes from the Bible today. A preacher can pretty much say whatever they want, have a couple of texts uh, for, for proof. These are my proof texts to back up what I'm saying. And people will assume that he really speaks from the Bible. Here's what I tell you all the time. And this is the problem in the Western church. We take portions of Scripture or one Scripture and we build theology on it or doctrine on it. And we don't even know the basis of why it was written, how it was written, to it was written, the culture. We don't understand any of it. But we base this thinking on a couple of proof texts. We have to be careful. It's important for each Christ follower to know the Bible for themselves. Not to be deceived by someone who quotes the Bible, but not accurately or with correct application. Again, correct application. They might quote it correctly, but they may tell you to apply it in an incorrect way. And this is what we have to be careful about. This is why I love my schools, because we are in discussions all the time, holding each other accountable. And if we say something, we have to back it with Scripture. We can't just come out with some doctrine or theology, so-and-so told me this. No, we have to back it with Scripture. And then with that Scripture, we have to base it on, hey, historically, this is what they were writing and who they were writing to. It's very deep. It's very intense. Now, I love Jesus because Satan says it is written. <laughs> but Jesus comes back and says to him, again, it is written. He's like, let me remind you, fool. Again, it is written. I know the word. And he says, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. Jesus replied with Scripture but he replied with the scripture appropriately. He brought it in the correct context. It wasn't done to deceive or be deceptive, right? Jesus knew that if he was to force God to do something, he would be testing God. Something that's clearly forbidden. Satan saying, hey, throw yourself off here, man. Don't worry about it. God's got you. He's going to catch you. Don't worry about it, man. It's all good. But Satan is a deceiver. And he was tempting Jesus to do something that was contrary to who Jesus was and the nature of God. He would have been testing the Father. And this serves to warn us, church, against demanding something spectacular from God to demonstrate His love and His care. Oh, how many times have we caught ourselves doing that, man? Oh, God, if you just show me, if you just show me, if you just do this, God, if you just do that, God. Church, we're not to test God. We're to trust God, not test. So why is it wrong to test God? Well, doesn't God say, test, test me in this area of tithing when he, when he uh, pins what he says in, in the book of Malachi? It's the only place in the Bible that God says, test me, right? But even that test was really a test for us. Are you going to give me what you're supposed to give me? Because it's all mine anyways, right? Listen, the reason it's wrong to test God it's because it shows a lack of trust. When you trust someone, church, you don't have to put them through a series of tests to see if they can be trusted or if they're going to live up to their word. You don't have to do that, right? I, I trust my wife. I don't have to put her through a series of tests. Well, do I have to test her in this area over here? I don't have to test her. I trust her. I don't even have to think about it. And if you look back on the history of your mind, if you reach back and look back in the history of your mind, how many times did God bring you through? 
How many times did God bring you through? That's why you can trust him. See, God demonstrates his love and his willingness to care for us. But here's what happens. We get trapped in our emotions and our thinking and boo-hoo times and all this other stuff we go through. And that's okay, I get it. Those are real feelings and stuff. But we forget the fact that God has brought us through before and God will bring us through again. And I always say, if I get sick or somebody around me gets sick, I believe God can heal. I've seen him heal. We have laid hands on people and healed them. We've been through all of that. But you know what? If he doesn't heal and they die, he's still bringing them through. He's just bringing them through now to completion. So God's always going to win. He's always going to bring you through. Listen, the, t- the pride of life can trip us all up. It can make us want to show how much God loves us instead of us showing how much we love God. Now, is it wrong for us to want others to see God's love and protection? Is it wrong? What do you guys think? Well, it depends on your motive, right? We we want to demonstrate God's love. We want to show people the love of God, okay? And we talk about how much God loves us and cares for us and those types of things. But here's what I believe typically happens to us as human beings if we're not careful. We want others to think God somehow favors me or loves me more than others. And so we have to be very careful in our motives when it comes to letting others know God's love and care for us. See, God sees us differently than we do, church. Romans 5.8 tells us this, but God shows his love for us and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. See, that's how God sees us. We're sinners, and we're in need of grace and mercy in our lives. And so he brings Jesus, and Jesus comes, and he dies for us, and he does something that nobody else could do. And so God demonstrated his love for us before we were born, right? Jesus died over 2,000 years ago, long before any of us in this room were born. But that love that Jesus had for us, that care that God has for us, it was demonstrated on the cross 2,000 years ago. But today, you and I are recipients of that love and care. And really, the bottom line is, is what more of a spectacular thing could God have done than to give us Jesus? That's the most spectacular thing he could do. Yes, you may need a miracle tonight. Yes, you may be in need. Yes, you may be in lack. But I'm going to tell you something. If you got Jesus, you got more than you're ever going to need. Because Jesus will see it through to completion. So now we come to the third temptation that Satan hurls at Jesus, and it's the lust of the eyes. Matthew chapter 4, verse 8 says, Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain, showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, All these I will give you if you fall down and worship me. Then Jesus said to him, Be gone, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. So again, Satan is going to show Jesus something. The first time he gets Jesus into the mindset of commanding something to happen. But in the last two temptations, he's showing Jesus, he's revealing to Jesus these different things. Here he reveals to Jesus the kingdoms of the world. Now, I don't know how this worked. I don't know, but I mean, Jesus is God in the flesh, so I don't know. But Jesus was somehow, with Satan, able to see all the kingdoms of the world in their glory. What glory? The glory to come. This is a future glory. See, the nations and the kingdoms of the world are not in their glory right now. But when Jesus comes to the earth to reestablish his kingdom, they will be in their glory. So Satan fast forwards to whatever period of time that's going to be. And he plays on the lust of the eyes. John chapter 1, verse 2, 
or chapter 2, John, well, first John chapter 2, verse 16. It says, For everything in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, comes not from the Father, but from the world. The world and its desires pass away, but whoever does the will of God lives forever. So we see in John here those three areas that Jesus has attacked, but I want you to understand what it says, that these things don't come from, they don't come from the Father, but from the world, and then it says the world and its desires will pass away. So the world and its desires are going to pass away, and the kings are going to come into their glory. But in that time, Jesus will be reigning. And then it says, but whoever does the will of God lives forever. Jesus knew that the desires were going to pass. The hunger pains would pass. That that fleeting moment in his humanity where he may have felt compelled to leap off of the pinnacle was going to pass and he knew here that what satan was showing him was going to pass this desire was going to pass it's in god's hands when jesus comes into his kingdom remember jesus said he doesn't know when all this is going to happen now this last time that satan comes at jesus he doesn't attack his sonship the first two times he says if you are the son of god but this time, he doesn't attack his sonship. He doesn't question his sonship. He just takes him to this high mountain and shows him the kingdoms of the world in all their glory. Why doesn't he attack his sonship again? Because what he was showing Jesus, only the son could inherit. It wasn't a question of, are you the son of God? Now he's showing him what the son of God is going to inherit. And he says, look, if you just worship me, you can have it now. It can come to pass. There's a tactic that I want us to tap into real quick here with Satan. Satan is like the master negotiator, the master compromiser, the master salesman. He's trying to offer something to Jesus in return. And what was it that he wanted Jesus to do? Worship him. Worship him. Listen, Satan was inviting Jesus to take a shortcut around the cross. He was inviting him to take a shortcut around the cross. It was like, you know what? You can have this now. You don't need to go to the cross. You can have this now. This is yours for the taking now. Just bow down and worship me. And you know what? You don't have to worry about the cross. Now, there's people that say Satan didn't know what was going on with Jesus. Was Jesus did Satan know that Jesus was going to die on the cross? We're not quite sure. Scripture's not real clear on that. There is a scripture that gives us a hint of something, which is in Matthew 26, 53. When Jesus is in the garden and he's confronted by the, uh, the army um, to take him away, and Peter uh, lashes out and cuts some dude's ear off, he says in verse 53, do you think I cannot call on my father and he will at once put at my disposal more than 12 legions of angels? Now, some commentators say, hey, this is proof positive that those who had access to the heavenly realms knew what was going on. Jesus could have called down 12 legions of angels right there to handle everything and wipe everybody out. Possibly. But I also believe that there was legions of angels that were on standby at Jesus' beckoning at any moment or any time because he's over them that is their authority and they were there to assist the king but one thing i do know is that satan did know that jesus was going to inherit the kingdom of god that he was going to inherit the kingdoms of the earth and the reason is because he offers it to him 
if he will only bow down and worship him. Satan knows scripture. He knows what Isaiah says. He knows what Ezekiel says. He knows what all these books in the Bible say. And the book is clear that the Messiah is going to come. He's going to rule and reign on this earth. Satan has dominion over the earth. People don't want to hear that. They don't want to believe in demonic warfare. They don't want to believe that demons rule along with Satan, and they don't want to believe any of that kind of stuff. Listen, if there's any question who has authority over the earth right now, Jesus is answering it right now with his confrontation with Satan. Satan has dominion because he offers Jesus the kingdoms. He offers it to him. Church, you got to get your spiritual eyes on, man. You got to get your spiritual eyes on, and you got to see that we are in a spiritual battle. Paul says it, he writes about it in Ephesians. We read about putting on the armor of God and all these things, but we just don't believe it. But there is demonic warfare going on all the time. Demons are here, demons are everywhere, man. And they're working on behalf of darkness. Now, when Satan says, I will give you, okay. I want you to grasp something here, and I didn't catch this until this afternoon. This tells you who Satan is, and this tells you who Satan's about. Satan wanted to be worshipped more than having dominion over the earth. He was willing to give up the dominion and the authority that had been given to him He was willing to give it up if Jesus would just bow down and worship him. Satan wants to be worshipped, church. He wants you and I to worship him. And we have to be careful with this because the enemy's tactic is to promise you something good in return for allegiance with him. And that's what he's doing here with Jesus. If you just bow down to me, I'm going to give you this. Well, remember this right here. The danger is greatest when the end is good. What do you mean by that, pastor? I mean this, that you're in the greatest danger of falling to temptation when the outcome is good, when it's good for you. You can have that promotion. Just lie a little bit in the interview. What's one little lie? Just one. It's not going to hurt nothing. Everybody lies. Everybody lies to get what they want. Hey, you can have that car. Just change your income on the application. They don't check, right? Falsify your numbers for your boss so you look better, right? He's not busy checking on you. Just falsify your numbers. You're going to look better. Listen, allegiance to Satan means going against what God would have you do. We are to live above. We're to be blameless, That doesn't mean that we're not going to make mistakes and do stupid things, but we are to attempt to live a blameless life. What does that mean? That no accusation brought against you can stand. No accusation can stand. Allegiance with Satan means we're going against what God wants us to do. And Jesus knew there were no shortcuts, right? He knew he had to accomplish the Father's will that the coming kingdoms and their glory, was it was going to come at a future time, but Jesus had a mission to fulfill. He had to go to the cross, and we have to learn that principle ourselves, church. We cannot take shortcuts. I don't like taking shortcuts. People don't like that with me. They don't like it when I'm on people about, hey, you should have done it this way, or why are we doing it this way? Oh, well, it's not going to hurt anything. Yes, it does, because it's not right. It's not right. I don't know how you, I don't know how people live with themselves, man. Because when I take a shortcut, it bugs me. It bugs me. Now, at the end here, Jesus finally has had enough, and he says, away with you, Satan. And he says, for it is written. Now, Jesus replied with scripture again and commanded the devil to leave. And listen, church, in the same way, that Jesus commanded Satan to move on, we can do the same thing. James chapter 4, verse 7 tells us, Submit yourselves then to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Do you understand that when temptation is knocking at the door, that the first thing we need to do is what? Submit. Submit ourselves, what? To God. 
but we don't. We try to fight it on our own. If you're fighting an addiction, man, you can't fight it on your own. you got to submit to God. You submit, then resist. Submit to God. Get, go to the one who can help you first, and then resist what's coming at you. Jesus resists the devil's enticing offers, man. He submits to the will of God. He comes back with Scripture. And church, that's what we have to do. I find that when I don't fight Satan with Scripture, I lose. If I don't stand on God's promises, I lose. you got to understand this. It is the word that will overthrow Satan. It's not anything else. It's the word that overthrows Satan. We must realize that our only defense is the word of God, and it will wear down the enemy. It frustrates him. It drives him crazy. It drives him away. Why? Because the word is truth, and he hates the truth. And when you use Scripture in context and use it correctly, the devil goes nuts because he can't respond because truth will always break him. Now, one other thing I need to get, get to real quick before I end. To be tempted is not sin. I'll say that again. To be tempted is not sin. It's not sin. Some teach that, when you, that you're in sin when you're tempted. That's not true. Where does it say that anywhere in Scripture? Right? That's not true. Now, acting on the temptation, that's different. That is sin. But what you need to see here is even with the most horrible of, t- of temptations, it's not sin. Here we see Satan tempting Jesus in the worst way in the world to get him to worship. Jesus wasn't in sin because the temptation was coming at him, because the temptation was coming into his mind. Jesus thought about what Satan was saying. Why do I say that? Because he responded with thought. It is written. We have to be careful about what we call sin. And we also have to be very careful with temptation. We must fight against temptation. But we also must fight against that feeling that, well, here I am with the same temptation again. It's the one that I've had for my whole life. Now I'm faced with it again. And then you get this defeated attitude. And then you get this mindset of like, oh, well, I'm going to fall anyways. And so then you slowly slip yourself into the place where you don't want to be. Temptation is an outside source that begins to work itself inside. But temptation starts outside. And then it becomes a thought. And then from a thought, it becomes a desire. And from a desire, it goes into your heart. When temptation becomes a thought, church, we take it captive. We take it to the Lord. And when we take it to God, then we let Jesus handle it. And the temptation is a lot easier to, to, to handle. Real quickly, I'm going a little longer than I expected. Matthew 4.11, we're going to uh, tie up this section here. It says, Then the devil left him, and behold, angels came and were ministering to him. So the devil's like, gone. He leaves. And angels come and minister to Jesus. Now here's what you've got to peep out in this whole thing right here. The angelic help of Psalm 91.11 when he said, hey, the angels are going to come and not let you, you know, let your foot touch or get hurt or whatever, right? Jesus had refused that help because it was illegitimate. But now he accepts it because it's appropriately given. Listen, God will bring what you need at the right time. The angelic help would have been at the wrong time. But here, now it's the right time and Jesus accepted it. And so these angels, they come and minister to him. And what does this minister mean? It means that they came to assist Jesus in in any way needed, with food, with water, maybe a massage, I don't know. But they were just like, hey, we're here, Jesus, we're here for you. And so Jesus accepts the help from the angelic being. So what do we take from tonight? Well, we take the fact that, that Satan is the great tempter. 
and that Satan is ready to attack any one of us at any given time. But we have an example here in Matthew chapter 4 of exactly how we should respond. When the devil comes with any type of temptation, we need to respond in the same manner and the same way as Jesus. God's promises can only be fulfilled within his character. And they can never be forced. And I know some of us at this table, including myself, have tried to force God's hand. And his hand can't be forced, church. And this is why many Christian believers suffer needlessly. They try to do things to force God's hand, and you can't do that, man. We are to be led by the Spirit like Jesus, right? That's how we're to be led. And they're to respond in the Spirit like Jesus. And that's how we beat temptation. Lord, thank you for your word, and thank you for just your love and your grace. And um, just be with us as we leave this place tonight, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen.